Good morning, Norristown. Thank you so much, Pastor CG. Thank you to everyone for having me here this morning and allowing me this opportunity. Uh, as Pastor CG said, my name is uh, João Moraes. Now, I like to tell people that my parents were not trying to prank anyone, to make life hard on anyone. In Brazil, my name is just like John. So, but they didn't expect that I would move to the States. Uh, and even in uh, my last seven years in Texas, even Texans with all the Texas twang, the Southern draw, they still cannot do it. So don't try too hard. Let's spend our energy on the biblical text this morning. We're gonna be on Exodus chapter three. Exodus chapter three. This is the beginning of a grand story, a grand narrative of God bringing his people out of slavery in Egypt. Exodus chapter three, we are reading verses one through 17. Would you follow along as I read to you? Now Moses was standing to the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and look at this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses replied, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. To but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Pay attention to this question. Who am I? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your father has sent me to, to you. And they ask me, what's his name? Then what shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched you, oh, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites a land flowing with milk and honey. Let us pray. Good and holy God, you who are already present here, go ahead of the words that will come out of my mouth and prepare the hearts that will hear. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. Use me, even me, Lord, a man of unclean lips, for the honor and glory of your name. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I said, this is the beginning of a grand narrative, a great story, the Exodus story. But this morning, we are not focusing so much on the story, on the narrative that's going on here, as we are focusing on the interactions, the conversation between Moses and God, particularly on the questions that Moses asked God. Because the right question tunes our ears to the answers we need. You see, we, are, we, we tend to think that we need to have the right answers. And that's because we're conditioned to think that way. When a, when a child is still an infant, the parents hold the child in their arms, and as soon as the child starts making any kind of sound, they start pointing to daddy and say, who is that? Who is that? Hoping that the child will say anything that resembles dada. Okay, and if they say dada, we're like, yeah, it doesn't matter if the child said dada just because, but because they, we, they answered it right. That child is going to grow, grow up, go to school, and for the next however many years of their lives, and that can take a long time if you go to college and grad school or whatever, they're going to be expected to know the right answers to tests and to quizzes and to orders and all sorts of things. So much so that they may end up thinking that their worth is on knowing the right answers, right? I'm an A student, I'm a C student. If you're a student right now, know that your worth is not on knowing the right answers. Your worth as a child is as a child of God. But still, people keep asking you questions. And even when you're getting close to dying, people keep asking you questions. Grandma, who's going to be in your will? <laughs> right? Where do you want to be buried? Who's going to give the eulogy at your funeral? And they are expecting you to have the right answers, whatever the right answers are for them, right? They won't leave you alone even when you're dying. From birth to death, we are conditioned to believe that we need to have the right answers. And with so much pressure on having the right answers, we forget to ask better questions. And that's a problem because the Bible shows us that what we need is not to have better answers. We need to ask better questions. Because the right question tunes our ears to the answers we need. And so this morning we are learning from the two questions that Moses asks God. Two questions, and one is certainly better than the other. But since I'm a guy who starts with bad news and then good news, we're going to start with the questions that are not so good, okay? The first question comes in verse 11. If you're following this story, this is right after God tells Moses everything that's going to happen, how God is going to liberate the people, and how God is going to use Moses to lead the people out of Egypt. And Moses looks at God, and I can imagine Moses like trying to look and not look at the burning bush at the same time. And Moses looks at God, and he simply says, who am I that I will lead the people out of Egypt? Who am I? What a human question to ask. Have you ever asked this question? In the face of a, of a great challenge, you, you, you doubt yourself, right? Who am I to, to take this new position? Who am I to raise these children? Who am I to survive this disease? Who am I? In the face of great challenges, we doubt our strengths, we doubt our ability, we doubt ourselves. We ask, who am I? And this is such a human question, this is such a natural, common thing, that we've created a standard answer for the question of who am I. A, a right answer, a go-to answer, um, the answer that we always give when someone is doubting themselves. When, when we want to hype them up, we give them a pep talk. We remind them of all the reasons why they can't do that. You know the pep talk. The pep talk is the coach's halftime speech to a losing team. You know, any good sports movie has it, and about a month ago, that may have been what happened to the Chiefs against the Eagles. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Now, now, no, we don't talk. Oh, we don't talk about that. Okay. Now, it's it was that last call. It was that last call. The call that that doesn't. 
But, but that's the pep talk, right? The coach gets in the locker room and tells them all the reasons they need to win this game. They can do it. The pep talk is that scene in Goodwill Hunting when Chucky tells his friend Will, who is a gifted mathematician, that Will has to use his talents to get out of that miserable life in South Boston. The pep talk is when someone tells you all the reasons why you can do that. And the question is, who am I? The pep talk is our answer. But God doesn't give Moses a pep talk. God could give Moses a pep talk. There were things to hype Moses about. Moses was an Israelite who grew up in Pharaoh's court. I'm not sure if he was quite a prince of Egypt, as the movie shows, but, but I think that perhaps he knew the in and outs of the Egyptian court. He was there. He had some access. In chapter 2, we are also told that Moses killed a guy. So, I mean, this is bad, but he's strong, perhaps? He's also the son-in-law of the priest of Midian, Jethro. So perhaps Moses has some connections. And God could have leveraged those, right? God could have said, Moses, look at you. You have privileged information. Look at you. You're a strong guy. Look at you. You have a good networking. If you can do that, Moses, God could have given Moses a pep talk. But he didn't. In fact, God didn't even answer Moses' question. Verse 11, Moses asked, who am I? Verse 12, God says, I am with you. God is pointing Moses in a different direction. God is leading Moses to ask a better question. God is guiding Moses to the answer that God knows Moses needs. Now, if it sounds strange to you for someone to be guiding another person to ask a question, just think of career day at school. You know, career day at an elementary school. Not not any school, at elementary school. You bring all the professionals, uh, you, you work hard, you're a teacher, you work very hard to bring a surgeon and a firefighter and all these people with awesome careers to encourage these kids. And a teacher's biggest fear on career day is the questions that the children will ask. <laughs> because if you're a parent, you know that children ask the most random questions. You know, you bring that accomplished surgeon over there, the surgeon is there like, do you have question, kids? And then that sweet little boy raises his hand, and you, the teacher, are like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen now? What's going to happen? And then he asks, do you have a cat? I have a cat. <laughs> it's like the most random thing. So the teacher looks at the kid, kind of like in a kind of little whisper, and says, okay, perhaps ask her how it is to take care of sick people. Ask her how it is to be a doctor. Because the teacher knows that that child needs to start learning that. The teacher knows the answers that that child needs. God knows the answer that Moses needs. So God guides Moses to ask a better question, to ask the right question. God was the one who called Moses' attention in the first place. Moses only had to pay attention. And I say only had to pay attention, but that can be such a hard thing. We're reading a story in which Moses required a little bit of a divine nudge to pay attention. But I wonder what would it require for us to pay attention. You know, at least Moses saw the burning bush. I wonder if I would have seen the burning bush or if I would be walking, pasturing my sheep, looking at my phone, it's like, oh, you know, you go. Because we are conditioned to live looking at ourselves. There's a myth that we are connected to the whole world through this thing. And now let me tell you, our phones, our computers, they can connect us to the whole world. It's, it's possible. But the reality is, most of the time, they are connecting us to the very things that we want to hear. 
to the echo chambers that will just confirm our opinions. They are helping us to just look at ourselves, to become selfish. They are training us to, dare I say, become self-obsessed. And that's not just our phones, that's our society in general. We are told to look at ourselves, to look at our own, at who we are, at our own self. Kind of like a navel gazing, but not of the good kind. And with so much focus on ourselves, we only ask the questions that are on our own minds. Will I marry that guy? Can I get that position at work? Can I win the amazing race? Okay, maybe it's just me thinking about winning the amazing race, but, uh, but there's so much I noise, I noise, I, 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 me, 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 that we forget to look at the world around us. What is happening around us? There's so much I noise that, let me be bold here and say, perhaps that's for how we forget, or how we believe that God is silent. What if God is not silent? What if God is actually speaking? What if God is saying a whole lot of things, just not the ones we're expecting to hear? What if all that's needed is that we have our ears to it? Like Moses, we need to learn how to ask better questions. Because the right question tunes our ears to the answers we need. The right question tunes our ears to the answers we need. And the beautiful thing here is that the answer that Moses needed was already there. If you notice, as soon as Moses got to the burning bush, God said, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses got there. God was already giving him the answer he needed. You know, it's like, it's like a detective story. It's always the same, they're always the same, so they're pretty comfortable, uh, pretty comforting and pretty fun to read. Detective stories, there's a crime, something happens, the police rushes to the scene and starts collecting all the evidence, all the data, but they cannot come to a conclusion. They cannot reach a conclusion, they cannot figure out what happened. So they call him, you know, the seasoned detective, Sherlock Holmes, Hercule Poirot, whoever your favorite detective is. And as soon as that detective enters the room, they notice something that was already there, and that's going to be the key to solve the mystery, but nobody had seen. The scene never changes. What happened, happened. The, the seasoned detective knew the right questions to ask. That's the same thing with what's going on with Moses and God here. God is not here waiting for Moses to ask the right questions so that Moses gives the answer, or so that God gives the answer. God is not like a genie, like, hey Moses, if you give me the right, the, if you say the right word, if you say the magic word, I'm going to tell you. That's not, that's not who God is, y'all. God is a loving God, and he gi is giving us what we need. What we, he requires of us is attention, is, is to notice, is to see and to ask the right question. So led by God, Moses asks the right question. He doesn't insist on who am I. He changes his question and says, okay, who are you then? What's your name? And folks, that's the right question. Because that's the question that God is answering. So when Moses asks, who are you? He gets a full disclosure. God says, I am who I am. Now, you are reading this, this verse 14, I am who I am, and you're saying, João, so much for asking the, better, the best questions. What sort of answer is this? I am who I am. Well, I hate to break it to you that I didn't come all the way from Texas to give you the answer, okay? Christians have been studying this passage for 2,000 years. Jews have been studying this passage for 1,000 years more, and we haven't come to a full conclusion of exactly what this means. And I don't believe that we ever will on this side of eternity because this is God's identity. And God is a mystery. God is so much greater, so much beyond us that we get glimmers, we get glimpses. But one way to look at this, that, at this answer in this particular passage is that God is saying to Moses, when Moses asks, what's your name? Who are you? God is saying to Moses, 
I am who I am. You know who I am, Moses. The people know me. But you need a refresher. Do you need a reminder? So let, let, let me tell you who I am. Verse 16, I am the God who was, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, I am that God, the God of the promise, the God who talked to Abraham and said that I would give him the land of Canaan. I am that God. I am the God who was. But I'm also, verse 16, the second part, the God who is. I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up. In other words, I am the God who is. I didn't just create you and made a covenant and forget. I'm not a God who forgot about you, Abraham. I see you and I care. What if God is telling you this this morning? I see you and I care. I see you, my daughter. I see you, my son, and I care about what you're going through because I'm the God who is. And I am also the God who will be, verse 17, I will bring you out of Egypt into Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the God who was, who made the promise, and who will be, who will fulfill the promise. This is who God is. And that's the answer that Moses needs right now. And that's why God leads Moses to ask a better question. That's why the question is not who am I, but who are you? That's the question that God is answering. And the beautiful thing here is that, as I said, God was saying this, repeating it over and over again. We just went through verses 15, 16, and 17. But if you look closely at this text, you're going to notice that everything that was written in 16, 17, and 18 was also written in 6, 7, and 8. God was always giving the answer. Moses was the one who needed to pay attention. That's God's grace. And that was good news for Moses. And that's good news for us. Because the same thing keeps happening over and over again. God keeps giving his answer, and we keep being distracted. In the so-called age of authenticity, we are told to look at ourselves. We are told to figure out who we really are. We are told that the most important question we can possibly ask is, who am I? And distracted in that question, we lose sight of the world around us. Friends, the most important question is not who am I? In fact, if you try to answer that question by just looking at yourself, you're only going to get more confused. Because that's not the question that God is answering. That's not the question we were created to ask. Many centuries ago, an African Christian named Augustine said, said to God in a prayer, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. We were made to know God and rest in God. The only question remaining is how. How can we People who cannot even understand the meaning of God's name. How can we, people who take thousands of years to come up with some half answers, uh, how can we know this God? How can we, who cannot even imagine this God, come to know him to the point that we can rest in him? How can I? There's only one way. Only by God's grace we can know this God. There's only one way that we could ever understand and we could ever see or can ever conceive of this God. And that's the way that God used. And that way was by becoming flesh and bones like you and me. By coming to this earth, the word of God, Jesus Christ, and living in here 
so that we would have a picture, we would have the fullness of God in humanity so that we could come to know God. Jesus, Jesus is God's gracious answer to the right question. In Christ, when we look at Christ, we see who God is. When we look at Christ, we see the one who has existed from the beginning, who has come and lived and dwelled among us, a God who is not, who, who is not averse, who is not estranged to suffering, a God who knows what you're going through because he went through it. In Jesus, we have the fullness of God, the God who will come again to liberate us from the slavery of sin and bring us into the promised land of his presence. In Christ, we have the answer of God. An incredible thing, if that was not incredible enough. The wonderful thing is that when you look at Christ, when you look at this God, when you look at the fullness of God in Jesus Christ, you also, you also get the answer to your other question. Remember the other question? The other question, who am I? Yes, that other question. In him, we also have the answer to that question because Christ is the fullness of God and the fullness of humanity. In Christ, we see not exactly who we are, but who we are created to be. We see the one who is calling us to follow him, to imitate him. In Christ, we see our goal. We see who we are striving to be like. In Christ, you can be born again. By Christ, you are made a son of God. You are made a daughter of God. Through Christ, you can leave behind sins, regrets, mistakes, and find new life. In Christ, you can find who God is and who you were created to be. So folks, this morning, the invitation is simple, yet very difficult. I lead a chapel, chapel prayers for my students, uh, college students every day for 20 minutes. And I tell them that it's the easiest class that they will ever take and the hardest class that they will ever take. Because there is only one thing that I ask of them. Attention. Only to be present. And that's the invitation this morning. That's the invitation for this week. Will you pay attention to the world around you? Will you pay attention to how God is nudging you? Nudging you to step out of this world of self-obsession, to step out of the, of the search for the self and look at him and ask, who are you? Because that's the right question. And the right question tunes our ears to the answer we need. And the answer we need is found in one word, Jesus. Let us pray. Our good and holy God, praise be to your name. Thank you for your graceful answer, your grace-filled answer of Jesus Christ. Thank you because in him we find you, we find the fullness of God. And in him we can find who we're created to be. We pray this morning that this week we may be sensitive to your nudges. We be sensi may be sensitive to how you are revealing yourself to us, to how you are asking us to ask a better question, to step outside of ourselves and to get to know you more because you are revealing yourself to us in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, friends, as you go this morning, I pray with the Apostle Paul that you may know what is the length, 
and the width and the depth and the height of the love of Christ, even though it's beyond all knowledge, so that in Him you may attain to the fullness of being, the fullness of God Himself. Go in peace.